you always get what you want, invariably. Even though you may think that it's entirely opposed to your wishes. But if it's your karma, everything that happens to you, put it in another way, everything that comes to you is a return to you of what goes out of you. Yes, obviously, that's absurd. If you confine the definition of yourself to your voluntary conscious behavior. That's a ridiculous definition of oneself. Oneself, by a, any, any stretch of the imagination, must involve far more than the conscious and voluntary aspects of our behavior. And if we see that it involves intimately and inescapably the behavior of what we call the other, the not-self, the environment, and see that these two are moving together like the two sides of the snake when it swims. Then you get a very curious feeling. And you have to be careful of it. If you've got a Western background. Because, and this is what happens to a lot of people who play around with psychedelic chemicals. There are many, many cases of inflation among these people. That is to say, when you get this sensation that the two sides of the world, the inside and the outside, are moving together, you may think, I am ruling it. I am God in the Western sense of the word. Therefore, your ego, instead of being, as it were, integrated and uh, transcended with all this process, merely assumes vast dimensions has megalomania, is blown up by the mystical experience. And so you get the holier-than-thou people going around who seem to think that they're above all human conventions and uh, have no obligations to anyone or anything because they're divine and they can do as they damn please. That what they haven't realized is that doing as you will isn't a new kind of behavior that you suddenly put on and say, from now on I'm going to go around doing as I will. You have to realize first that that's what you've always been doing. And you can look at this from a very simple point of view. It's not a complete point of view. But you can say, well now what about the people who, who did good? and who did the things that they didn't want to do. You know, everybody's mother said to us, darling, sometimes we have to do things we don't like. <laughs> well, what about that? Well, you can always say, the kid obeyed the mother and did the thing that it didn't like because that was the better part of wisdom. In other words, if it hadn't done that, something worse would have happened. And we choose the lesser of two evils. And when you find yourself in a situation where you have to choose the lesser of two evils, then you say, I want out of here. And you take the easiest way. You take the line of least resistance. So that's your doing. Now, uh, you, you can pursue that more profoundly when you stop thinking about human behavior as something that responds to the compulsion of an environment. And you can get out of that when you see the behavior of the environment as an essential aspect of you. So it isn't, as it were, the environment starting something, which you are therefore compelled to follow. It's the whole system moving together. So then, you get in the state of liberated or mystical consciousness, you very often feel that a hill is lifting you up as you walk up it. The ground seems to heave beneath your feet, and up you go. And you get this strange feeling of lightness, of effortlessness. Walking on air, never a care, you know. This uh, wonderful sense that there are no obstructions anywhere. There's nothing as it were banging you and making you do that. It all flows together. And that's a very common sense. And that's, you are actually, uh, in, in that state of consciousness, you are perceiving the goings-on, uh, the Tao, the course of nature, in the way it's happening. But in the ordinary way, you've been conditioned to resist it, to fight it, and to use those sensations of resistance to create a sensory basis
for what you describe as the ego. The ego in practice is a sense of strain. When you are aware of I, you are aware of a dis basic discomfort, which is located basically between the eyes, somewhere in here, a sort of tightness. Also, it's in other centers too, it's uh, in the solar plexus, and uh, there are various physical centers, in other words, where this constant tension or resistance against it is going on. And that's what you feel when you talk about I. When that tension ceases, you discover immediately that the separate ego has disappeared and that what I refers to is simply the total panorama of experience, everything that's happening. That's I. And I've, I'm not, obviously I don't know all of it because I can't inspect all of it with my radar, with my conscious attention. That would be a ridiculous undertaking to know everything in that sense. We know it in a much better way as we know how to grow hair and open and close our hands. So, this point of view can be understood if we clarify the initial problems we have about it. And I suppose the first problem is if we accept the notion that everything that happens to us is our own karma, our own doing, then we have to be very careful of, shall we say, the devil of omnipotence, of inflation, of uh, feeling that your ego is what is in control of all this. And the second thing is, if you think then that everything that happens to everybody is what they really want to happen, then you can absolve yourself from any qualms about being unkind to someone because you could say, well, the unkindness I did you was what you really wanted, wasn't it? You know that business about <laughs> the responsibility of the person who gets murdered for getting murdered? Uh, there is a curious sense in which a lot of people go around looking for trouble. Uh, Freud points, pointed out quite correctly uh, the psychology of accident-prone individuals. They seem to be attracting trouble like lights attract moths. And we're all doing that, but we manage to remain unconscious of it. So that we can praise and blame and play the game which says, that's not my fault, that's your fault. And so we go around apportioning faults to everybody. Because if we're going to apportion praise for what the good things people do, you can't make praise mean anything unless you also go around blaming. Praise and blame go together. Supposing everybody was acting in a praiseworthy way, and we praised everybody for everything, they'd get tired of it. They wouldn't even notice it anymore. So, so long as you're going to get a kick out of being praised, You've got to go around blaming too. It's very simple. But if you see the folly of that, that praising and blaming are just <laughs> creating each other, then you don't praise and you don't blame. You just dig the whole thing. And that's why when we encounter very great sages, you never hear them blame people and they very rarely praise anyone. You try to start gossip in the presence of such a person and you make a derogatory comment about someone. It's as if you had thrown a rock into a well and heard no splash. And a funny feeling. Because that you get no response. You get no agreement. And uh, if you praise somebody, there is also likely nothing to be said except perhaps some remark that, of course, you're praising the Beloved in all its manifestations. And this, this disconcerts some people terribly. I've always noticed that real sages never gossip, never criticize persons. And uh, because they understand so well 
the French saying, to comprendre, c'est to pardonner, to understand all is to forgive all, uh, is so true if you are experienced in just the ordinary way of dealing with human problems. If you've been a counselor or psychotherapist or minister or anything like that, you very soon get to realize how vastly complicated people are and to see that they really are in the messes they're in, not because of anything, <laughs> but that's the way it is. And you stop blaming people and because you don't blame people, you have open ears and people come and see seek your advice. Because they don't want to come to someone who's a counselor who will bawl them out. It's like dentists who simply accept the fact that people really don't take care of their teeth and realize that the job of a dentist is precisely to look after people who can't be bothered to take care of their teeth. That's why he's in business. <laughs> so a good dentist doesn't bawl his patients out because they didn't do this, that and the other. Just accept it. Same with doctors. They know perfectly well that nobody's going to live by the rules of health. And they're very vague as to what they are. And, <laughs> you know, there's every kind of theory about how you ought to live and what is healthy, but they've changed in fashion. And uh, you, you ought to eat this kind of diet in 1921. By the time it's 1930, they've changed their ideas altogether. By the time it's 1960, it's back again to a mixture between 1921 and 1894. Something like that. You see, it's always changing. So, um, while the rules that are not so... You see, if, if they were all absurd, it would be easy. <laughs> but they're not all absurd. There's some truth in it, always. But nobody's ever quite sure. So the function of healers and doctors and so on is just to, uh, to do what can be done to stop the mess getting too messy. And they must accept it as that. That's their job. If I were healthy, you'd say to the doctor, I wouldn't need you. So you're in business. Now, what about it then? Uh, we have difficulty in seeing this mutuality of our relationship to the rest of the world because it's contrary to common sense, contrary to the way we've been brought up. And therefore we have a, what I would call an initial intellectual block to understanding it, quite apart from any emotional blocks or anything of that kind. But obviously we must overcome that intellectual block if we're going to go any further and actually realize and feel this way of life's working in this relationship between what you do and what happens to you. Then the question arises, then what do I do? Do I go around saying to myself, all this that's happening to you is what I wanted. I am inside and outside. I am the subjective and I am the objective. And I mean you go around thinking thoughts about this. So as, as it were to talk yourself into this way of feeling. Well that's very superficial. Because this new sense of relationship to nature is something much more than an idea See, ecologists and physicists have the idea that this is so. But they, mostly in their private life and in their ordinary human behavior, are just like other people who don't feel it and who feel themselves in a Newtonian billiards game, even though they've gone on to quantum mechanics. So that there may be a transition from our ordinary way of feeling how things go on to the new way, we have to do something other than think. Because actually thinking is causing the trouble. It is by thinking that we divide the world into separate events and separate things. That is calculus. And 
Ananda Kumaraswamy once described the life of the liberated being as a perpetual, uncalculated life in the present. And you say, wow, I don't think I could do that. That saying of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, I'll be not anxious for the morrow, the uncalculated life. If God so clothe the grass of the field, will he not much more clothe you, faithless ones? And I've never met a preacher yet who would uh, really take that up. They all say, well, of course, that's too hard a saying for most of us. Uh, it's not practical. Everybody has to uh, take thought for tomorrow and uh, calculate. Well, at this point, people can go in two directions. There's one class of people who will say, all right, let's live the uncalculated life. Let's not make any plans. And before you know where they are, they're living in a filthy pad and uh, scrounging around and living on petty thievery and so on. This is the usual thing. This is uh, got into it the wrong way. The first thing to do is just as I said whether you like it or not and whether you know it or not the relationship between you and the environment is always one that is harmonious. So in the same way you are always living the uncalculated life. And you have to find out first of all that you're always doing it and that what you call your calculations uh, and the things you did were funny little rationalizations. In other words, your ego has about as much control over what goes on as a child sitting next to its father in a car with a plastic steering wheel that is turning the car the way daddy drives it. Because, as I pointed out, most of the functions, most of the goings-on, in you, around you, the circumstances of life, have nothing to do with your ego at all. And you don't even know why you make up your mind to do certain things. We know superficially, we have a few ideas. It's like when you uh, enter into a marriage, you have really no control over its outcome in the ordinary sense of ego control. Uh, you've taken a colossal gamble in which you've involved e enormous complexes of patterns. And maybe it'll come out all right if you don't interfere with it too much. <laughs> you don't, it's like Oppenheimer said, it's perfectly obvious that the whole world is going to hell. And the only possible way we might stop that happening is not to try to prevent it. You know, all these wars are started out by people who think that they're helping someone. That uh, <laughs> it's going to make things better. So, when you begin from the basis, not of saying, I should now live the spontaneous and improvident and non-calculating style of life. But realize you've always done that. Only you rationalized that you didn't. You always did what you wanted to do. Basically. Only you said sometimes it was my duty. But you preferred a conception of yourself as someone who always does his duty. That flattered you. And so you were still following your own way. Now the first thing then is to see that. that. That's what's happening. So that you don't think, well now, there is some special thing I have to do to understand this harmonious relationship between the individual and the world. 
Because if you work on it that way, you will start from the presupposition that that relationship doesn't already exist and has to be brought into being. The thing is, it doesn't have to be brought into being. It's there. But now when you see that that's so, it obviously starts to make a difference. You do behave in a different way. But the behavior, the new kind of behavior that is a result of a transformation is not forced behavior. When you try to imitate the way a saint behaves, you have made a forced change and you know all forced behavior is phony. It's like someone saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, when you don't. You feel you ought to, but you don't really. And there's something that doesn't ring true. Well, think of the poor Lord listening to all the prayers of all those people saying, I love you, Jesus. And, they, and they, he knows they don't. <laughs> They're just saying this because they think they ought to. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they're very trying. <laughs> so whenever you do a thing like that you see you, you, you make a forced change now if the change is to happen in the same way that a seed at proper season breaks open and sends up a shoot see it comes from the whole force of life itself now when you see that without your having to do anything you see you are living the uncalculated life and you're only pretending you're calculating it and arranging it. Then, as it were, you will have a grasp of the total situation and it will, you can allow it to produce changes in action which are not forced. So this is why there is always a trend in every kind of spiritual doctrine which says something about grace, divine grace. There must come about something in you, a change, which you can't produce. And if you try to produce it, you will be a victim of spiritual pride. But on the other hand, all teachers are universally saying, you've got to make an effort. There is some discipline, there is some, something you must do. Well, that's the only way to get it across to people that you, as a separate effort maker, are a myth, are a phantasm. Because if you really try to control your mind and only think the thoughts that you think are good thoughts to think, you will find that you're going round in a circle. Krishnamurti is awfully good at pointing this out. When he People ask him, how do you meditate? He says, why do you want to meditate? Why are you concentrating? Why are you saying prayers? Why do you think you should believe in God? And it always comes up because I'm just a son of a bitch. I mean, I'm out for my own good and this seems to be the, be the way. So he says, you see, you don't have any genuine love at all. It's all fake. And so you have to find, first of all, where the genuine love is. Now, you love you, don't you? That's genuine. We won't argue about that. But then, when you start from this, I gave a talk some time ago to um, the Air Force. The <laughs> camp, or lab where they make weapons, do all the research. And they got a bunch of us there who were ministers and philosophers. And they had the nerve to ask us, what was our basis for moral behavior, personal moral behavior? Well, I said, my basis for moral behavior is pure selfishness. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking, after all, to realistic people here. And I don't think we need to be sentimental and beat about the bush. After all, you're all warriors and fighters and so on, and uh, you know how rough things are. So um, uh, I'm going to say to you, frankly, uh, I'm out for me. But of course, I don't do it in a tactless way. <laughs> I don't go around and hit people over the head and say, give me this, give me that. I'm much more subtle. I say, 
with good manners and pleas and uh, how nice you all are and so on. And finally, uh, people feel uh, massaged psychologically into a state where they'll give. <laughs> but then I said after that, there's some things that bother me. The first one is, if I love me, what do I want? And furthermore, who am I? Because if I'm going to be realistic about getting what I want, I've got to be pretty sure what it is that's me and what is the state of desire in me. If I am desire, see, if I am a center of desire, what's it all for? Well, I think of all the things I want. Well, it so turns out that none of them are me. When I say I want dinner, I don't mean I'm going to eat me up. If I... Any pleasure I can think of is the enjoyment of something that I hadn't thought of defining as myself. Because I like my sensations. I like what happens to my body when I take a fine wine and down it. But then what's the difference between my body and the wine? If I say I like the wine, I also mean I like me and the wine together. The mixture. But then I don't eat you or a friend or a lover in the same way as I drink wine. I live in association and like this. But then I'm loving things that aren't formally supposed to be me. And as I go into it, in other words, as I investigate what I mean by me, I find that I can't put any limits on it. That I cannot experience me without you or without the other. And they're inseparable. But you don't find this out until you investigate it. Until you really go into the question, what do I want? And that's the most important investigation anyone can make, which I'm going to into in the next session. Uh, the question of power. And all these military men, you think they, they think they want power. And so I said to them some very subversive and undermining things uh, without anybody knowing it until long after I'd left. <laughs>